Build it from us. <laughs> All right, so uh, before we start, if any grad students or faculty uh, want to come to dinner, it's going to be at around 6.45, um, location to be determined. But let me know during the break. And then it's my pleasure to introduce Nicholas Paddington from the University of Oregon, talking about curve, curves of unequal degree. Completed, completed intersections. intersections of unequal degree. Unequal degree. I, was that my title? OK, so I've been, I've been told to start by talking to grad students for for as long as possible, so. It's <laughs> 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 not suspicious. So that's oh. the you might have the old dead pen problem. Oh, so the middle ones are the new ones. Uh, so I want to start by just talking about matrix factorizations. And as we were discussing at lunch, Matrix factorizations mean something else in applied math, but in algebraic geometry, it goes back to Eisenbud, and the idea is this. If I take a polynomial like uh, x, y minus z, w, this is irreducible. And, you know, let's see, I'm joined in this ring. Uh, one way to see that is that the associated hypersurface is, is smooth. It's not a union of two things. Um, on the other hand, this matrix, x, y minus z, w, so just the same, the same function down the diagonal, can be factored in an interesting way. So on the other hand, this thing I can factor as x, y, z, w times the <coughs> Classical adjoint, y, x, minus So this is, if I call this thing f, this is a matrix factorization. Matrix factorization. Matrix factorization. It's a pair of matrices whose product, a pair of square matrices of the same size whose product is um, just the diagonal matrix that's mapped down the diagonal. So the diagonal part is, the diagonal matrix is a part of the definition. So the zeros of diagonal yeah, so is a requirement. So there you go. This is f times the 2 by 2 identity matrix. And uh, this is, this is in, in this case, with this quadric, this is essentially the only matrix factorization. This one, and then there's sort of the transpose of this, um, and that's that's about it. Any other matrix factorization is a is a direct sum of this and its transpose, um, as many times as you like. And so that's not very very exciting. So this is essentially the only one for this f. Um, but for, for, for polynomials of higher degree, your matrix factorizations can, can move. And so let's say that f is a cubic, and I want a homogeneous cubic in C, x, y, z. And so it cuts out some, uh, some you know, elliptic curve. So here's the set where f is zero in P2. And if there are any students who are not happy with P2, you can just, you can take your homogeneous cubic. You know, so for example, the one I drew is uh, y squared z minus x cubed plus x z squared. And to get that picture, you just set z equals one. So. If you're not happy with projective geometry, just get rid of the last variable and take a um, So for any point on this on this cubic curve, I can get a matrix factorization of f. And so how I want to do it is I'm going to say that let's take a point in the curve, 
then write it as L1 equals L2 equals 0, where the L1 and L2 are linear. So if you wanted the origin, L1 would be x and L2 would be y. Um, and then because, um, because f of the point is 0, you can write f is L1q1 plus L2q2, where the qi's are quadratic. And then the matrix factorization is going to be f0, 0, 0, f is L1, Q1 minus L2, Q2 times um, the classical adjoint. I haven't done that one. Right. So maybe in this example, my point is my point. 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, and then my L1 is x, L2 is y, um, Q1 then I guess should probably be uh, z squared minus x squared, and Q2 should be y squared. But the point is, so first of all I made a bunch of choices, right? I, I chose my linear form, a after choosing my point I chose my linear forms, and my quadratic forms. And at first I want to claim, I'm not going to prove it, that if I had made those choices differently, I would come out with an equivalence matrix factorization. Right, so if, if I call these maybe M and N, and then my, you know, if I, if I turn M into A, M, B inverse, and N into B, N, A inverse, that's not really different. Right, that's sort of a boring transformation. But if I move the point, then I really get something different. So if I, if I make these choices differently, if I choose L and Q differently, I get an equivalent matrix factorization. But if I move the point, I don't. And actually, how do you, what's well, maybe one way to see that? about that is I could take these two matrices M and N and um, if I do this right I'm going to get I'm going to get a map uh, I want to put N here and N is either going to go from O minus 2 plus O minus 3 O, is that right? No, I guess it's M that does that. And, sorry, O minus 1 plus O minus 2. And N goes like this. And if I just took the co-kernel of M, or maybe the image of M, Is the line bundle O O the curve of minus the point inside of no. no I really do want sorry I really do want the co-curl is the line bundle O C of the point so so this is this is a line bundle when you move a point, you really get a different line. Um, so, so moduli spaces of matrix factorizations could be an interesting subject. I also want you to notice that a matrix factorization is, is, is like a complex of, of, of vector bundles. You know, uh, you know what, 
one, two, three, I call these D, where instead of D squared is multiplication by F instead of D squared equals zero. And you find that that force is actually the, the complex to be periodic in a way in a way that doesn't happen when D squared is zero. So, so just the same way you make, when you're doing homological algebra, the way you make a category of complexes and then, and then you mod it, so you, you take chain maps, mod chain homotopies, you can do all that same thing here. And you can make a category. In this case, the Ds were M, N, They were both two by two. Oh, oh sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It should have been squared. I'm sorry. Thank you. So you find that the rank of E1 in this case is the rank of E2. And there's a business about I was working with homogeneous polynomials and everything sort of worked nicely and homogeneously. That you get something called graded matrix factorizations if you keep that hygiene correct. And I don't want to dwell on that, but in everything that I state, I'm, for those who know, I'm talking about graded matrix factorizations. Where all my homogeneous hygiene is clean. And is it co-kernel or something different than that? Co-kernel is something different. Yeah, um, Let's see. So the thing is ranked across ranked along the, the cubic. Sorry, maybe, yeah, the thing, exactly. M, right, because M was something like um, L1 Q2, L1 Q2 minus Q1 minus L1 minus L2. Thank you. So indeed, as you say, the, the determinant of this matrix is exactly F. So the matrix is full rank away from it, right? So here's P2, and here's the curve where F equals zero. So you have a map that's full rank away from there, so you're really getting, the co-kernel is nothing away from there. Then along the curve, the rank of M drops, and then it drops to one, and you're getting something of rank one there. And then M never, M never drops to zero except at the Relevant point. I don't promise that it's exactly this line bundle, but it's some line bundle that's derived from this in a reasonable way. And really, when you move the point, you really get a different line bundle for, this, for the usual. So, the reason I said let's, let's make a category of these uh, is I want to talk about a theorem of Orlov. From what was this there? Mid 2000s? You know, does everything from before you got your PhD happen at the same time? So I got my PhD in 2009, so this was shortly before that. Uh, I want to say the arc 5. Maybe. Um, so let x in Pn be smooth. Of degree uh, smooth um, and cut out by a polynomial f of degree d. So a hypersurface of degree d. And the theorem is first of all, if d is n plus 1, so um, maybe I'll just point out the canonical bundle of x is O of minus n minus 1. So if d is n plus 1, 
then omega x is trivial. You're talking about a Calabi-Yau variety. Um, then the derived category of coherent sheaves on x, which I should probably say something about, um, is equivalent to this category of matrix factorizations, gradient matrix factorizations. Like that. Um, if, uh, so I'll, I'll explain. If D is less than n plus 1, so, so, the, uh, so this is x, let's go on the end. And So if D is x less than n plus 1, so x is final, so the canonical bundle is negative, or if you like, if you like geometry, this is some sort of positive curvature of the, of the manifold. Um, then the derived category of X has a semi-orthogonal decomposition, so I'll definitely say what that is. And two matrix factorizations of F, and then a bunch of trivial stuff, OX. And then OX of, uh, what's the base thing I can put here? Uh, N minus D. D is n plus 1, but if D is n, then this is a list of one thing, right? And then if D is bigger than n plus 1, there's also some result that I don't particularly care about today. So this is um, So uh, Mark, guide me. How much should I say about the derived category right now? <laughs> I think there are people who have not seen it. I have no idea what it is. Okay. Um, so the derived category, I won't write, I'll just say the derived category starts life in the 60s and 70s as a bookkeeping device for homological algebra. So, you know, in homological algebra, you're always taking the resolution of your module or your sheaf or whatever by a complex of projectives or injectives or flats or whatever, factor models. So the objects of the derived category are complexes, sequences of or complexes of sheaves, or if you're doing rings, then you should take complexes of modules. And the maps are such that the sheaf that you like becomes isomorphic to all its resolutions by injectives or, or whatever, factor bundles. And so it, as I say, it's a bookkeeping device for homological algebra. And, takes care of all that um, changing you know sometimes you want to apply this functor and then that functor and you have to change your resolution so it takes care of all that. but then in the 80s and 90s due to work of Orlov uh, Obondel and Orlov uh, Mukai before them we, we find out that the derived category has uh, has geometric content so I should say the derived category contains the category of sheaves and a little bit more. Um, so maybe I want to say that the v of x has a cohomological flavor. So whatever formulas you have for the cohomology of a projective bundle or the cohomology of a blob along a smooth center, um, you can refine those, or you can at least prove formally similar looking statements about the derived category. When you blow up, it changes in the same way that the cohomology does. And moreover, when, when you see the cohomology of one variety sitting inside the cohomology of another variety in a, in a nice way, and we'll see an example of that, then you should, you should try to refine that to find the, the derived category of this variety sitting embedded in the derived category of that variety. And so, This notation, by the way, you notice if I take n is 2 and d is 3, and that's saying the derived category of sheaves on my elliptic curve is equivalent to that category of matrix factorizations. And I, I showed you some example of that, where I took a line bundle on the curve and turned it into a matrix factorization. You can do that systematically for any sheaf on your curve, not just line bundles of a certain degree. Um, 
So next I should, um, I should explain what this notation means. Um, so this thing is called the semi-orthogonal decomposition. Sorry, can yes, I, please. Well, can I keep you on the not writing, you know, and just yes. discussing in a friendly way? Uh -huh. So this isomorphisms are in general like, how explicit are they? I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something very explicit in a minute. Um, but there are, there, there's not just one, there's sort of Z's worth of choices of this, but after you make that choice, it's very explicit. Um, it's sort of, yeah, you, you, take, you take your sheaf. Yeah, maybe, maybe the, is it, what I'm about to say is almost true. You, you take your sheaf, you take its minimal resolution by minimal free resolution in the sense that maybe you read in Eisenbahn by sums of line levels. And so you'll have your sheet. And it'll come from some sum of O of Ki, so from some sum of O of Kj, and so on. And what Eisenbahn notices, this is where this theory gets started, is that if you're on a hypersurface, this is very special to hypersurfaces, that eventually this uh, sequence will stabilize. It'll become too periodic. And pretty much that's your matrix factorization. Um, it's, it's almost yeah, it's almost as simple as that. So to make it true, you have to restrict which, which degrees you're allowed to use. So this equivalence basically makes sense for hypersurfaces. Yes, for hypersurfaces. Exactly. Well, for Calabiao hypersurfaces, you get an equivalence. For Calabiao, yeah. yeah. For, hon for final hypersurfaces, you somehow well, what I'm, what I'm working up to saying is that this is the interesting piece of the derived category. The derived category splits into this piece, which is interesting, and all this, which is boring. Uh, if, if you like cohomology, you can think of this as like the primitive cohomology, and this is all the rest of it. So these are O sub Fs? O for O sub X? X, yeah. yeah. So F. So she. So then out here, it eventually becomes too periodic. And so it'll be, you know, some of them. Some of O of K's, some of O of L's, and then some of the same O of K's minus D. And this will be your M, and this will be your M. Is there a left hand step theorem when the ambient space is something other than protective space? Yeah, that's the whole subject of homological projective duality. That no wonder I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> but then, so, so the derived category of Pn is really simple. It's generated by n plus one line bundles in a really boring way. Great. Um, and and when you start when you start chopping it with hypersurfaces. Then you sort of keep as much of the boring stuff as you can, and then you get a new interesting piece, which is like the proof of Um Kuznetsov has this whole theory of if you have any space with, he calls it a Lefschetz semi orthogonal decomposition, semi decomposition of Lefschetz type, where you have it, you can break it into pieces where sort of you have the first one, and then the second one is the twist of the first one. I, it's painful to state precisely, but but sort of what you what kind of decomposition you need on your ambient variety, so that when you slice it with hypersurfaces, you get sort of a few copies of the boring stuff and then something new. And on and on. Yeah. So the, the, for the students, if that didn't mean anything to you, it's because I didn't. <laughs> say anything, <laughs> but uh, but the, the words the words if you want to go Google are homological. And I, I apologize for the very Russian way in which Kuznetsov, like Kuznetsov just states all this stuff really mercilessly. He has all this beautiful motivation, which he doesn't tell you. <laughs> five or ten years after your PhD. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, well, I wanted to explain about this semi orthogonal decomposition. Composition. 
And you should think of this as, so I'm going to decompose x into a, a subcategory that's isomorphic to this, or equivalent to this, a subcategory that's generated by this. So the first thing to note is that the x algebra of one of these line models, O of k with itself, is you have c if i equals 0, so the thing is simple, and then 0 if i is bigger than 0. So in particular, from x to 1, you see that it's rigid. From all your higher, it's sort of derived simple, if you like. And therefore, the subcategory of, um, of d of x generated by O of k. So you take you take O of k, you sort of take complexes of things whose terms are all O of k. And it's really boring. It's equivalent, equivalent to just the to the derived category of a point. Because uh, the structure sheet of a point has the same form. The derived category of a point is just you have some number of copies of the the structure sheaf in degree 0, in degree 1, degree 2. Um, right, so, so, so you have, okay, so that's the first part, that this embeds fully faithfully, that these generate a copy, each one of these generates a different copy of the derived category of a point. And the next is that there are no Homs or Xs from left right, no, from right to left, to left. So that's what the semi-orthogonal means. You can't ask for no homs in either direction, or your, your variety would be disconnected. So you should think of it like the, you should think of it like a German, uh, you know, a composition series for a group. Right? You split it into a chain of subgroups, where the quotients are things that you understand really well. And in this case, you have this, and then what's generated by these two, and generated by these three, and so on. And at each point, the quotient is either this interesting piece or the derived category of a point many times. You should think of it as something interesting extended by something more. And so then also, parabolic four technique, so also these objects generate. And this idea of a semi-orthogonal decomposition sounds very dry, but it was Bonal and Orlov brought it up, and the idea is that whenever you can find such a thing, it's very special, and it suggests it should have some geometric meaning. So Renzo asked about how, how, how should we understand this. Okay. So later we'll have, we'll have an example where x is not a hypersurface, but an intersection of maybe two quadrics. And then you get a very a really interesting semi-orthogonal decomposition. But I want to introduce our main tool. Um, which is sometimes it's called the gauge linear signal model, but in math we should call it uh, variation of GIT quotients. So maybe I'll maybe I'll I'll restrict myself to that. Um, maybe I'll talk about a cubic fourfold because that is my favorite subject. So so, so for example, the X smooth cubic AP5. That's going to be cut out by some path called x mod up to x5. But you'll see I've just picked degree 3 and, and d equals 3 and n equals 5 just to, just to bring things down to earth. It'll be clear how everything works otherwise. So I'm going to let, let c star 
effect on C7 with the following coordinates. One of them is P, and then the others are X0 to X5. And we'll let it act with the following weights. Weights uh, minus 3, 1, up to 1. So this is a nice GIT project. And, and if you don't know anything about GIT, uh, you, don't, you don't need to, except that what we're going to do is we're going to delete some subset of this so that we get a nice quotient. So if we delete, if we del delete the locus where x0 up to x5 are all 0, and then the quotient, so you can see that the, the quotient maps to, right, if I didn't have p there, I would just get out p5. So the quotient maps to p5, and you can see that it's a line bundle over it. Right? If I fix, um, right, if I have a point here, and I use my C star action to, to kill off rescaling of the x's, then p can do whatever it likes. So it's, it's a line bundle. In fact, you won't be surprised to hear that it's O P5 minus 3. And I'm going to take a function, we we'll call it W, is P times F. And, and this function, um, this is, is a C star invariant function. Right. If I rescale the x's with weight 1, then I'm going to get, you know, by alpha, I'm going to get an alpha cubed out front. But p is going to get rescaled by alpha to the minus 3. And it's, it's fine. So it descends to, it descends a function on O P5 and minus 3 on the total space. Okay. Maybe you're not used to thinking of line bundles as space, the spaces, but you can have a function on that. And it's um, What, what is this function? This function, nope. this function, it corresponds to the section of O of 3, O of 5 of 3, that cuts out uh, x, which you might call that. Right, a map from O to O of 3 is the same as a map from O, I just take the dual of everything, it's the same as a map from O minus 3 to up. So this is a section of O of 3 that cuts out x, and this is a function on the total space of O minus 3. And follow it through and it really is the same. And what is it? Maybe let's think. Of it. So here's here's going to be so that that green one and that black one in the middle there. These are ones are definitely new. So here's P three. Here's the total space of O minus three. And I want to think about the locus where W is zero. So W equals zero. On the one hand, p, right, w is p times f. So either either p is zero, right here's, or f is zero. And the locus where p and f are both zero, so p is acting like the coordinate of the fibers. And of course, the thing is in a trivial line level, so that doesn't quite make sense. But 
um, it's a homogeneous coordinate of the fibers. So the locus where P and F are both zero, this is X. And so you have like some, there's X. Your P3 is a P5. P5, thank you. Maybe the notes is P3. So, in particular, I want you to notice that the critical locus of W, where the derivative of W vanishes, is exactly x. And um, where am I going with all this? Oh dear. You guys have got to get a better board. <laughs> Kill me. Um, so, <clears throat> so the matrix factorizations on this space, total space of O minus three, with respect to this W, um, is in a really easy way equivalent to the derived category of X. I haven't, I haven't defined in, in great detail what the category of matrix factorization is. So maybe I don't want to, but the, the functor is something like you take a sheaf on X, uh, you pull it up to get a sheaf supported here, and you take some resolution, and you roll it up. You roll it up, to, you, you get a matrix factorization in the way that I said, by, by this two periodic business, and that takes care of this issue that I was saying to Renzo, you have to be careful. When you do it this way, you don't have to be careful. So that was the first GIT quotient, right? So we had, just to rewrite what I accidentally erased, six, seven, eight, On the other hand, so the other, the other GIT quotient, so this is when we delete all the Xi's in zero. We got that thing. The other GIT quotient is just we delete the locus where P is zero. And, and then the quotient well, now I can, I can use my C star action. If P is not zero, I can use my C star action to just set P equal to one. Right, so I just get C6 with coordinates X naught up to X5. But because the C star acted with weight three, there's sort of a residual action of the cube roots of unity there. So mod. And matrix factorizations of this C6 mod Z3 uh, of the same W. Remember, now if I set, you know, if I set X equal to, if I set P equal to one, then W is really just F. Um, this is Orlov's um, graded matrix factorizations. Which I didn't define, but this this is the best the best definition of them is you take um, you can define matrix factorizations on any space with any superpotential, and uh, and this is the one that gives you Orlov's thing, and that's the one that gives you the good old derived category, and the point is if these weights add up to zero, then by some change of GIT results that are very popular these days, you get an equivalence. If they went, add up to a positive number, you get an injection this way. And if they add up to a negative number, you get an injection, or you know, an embedding that way. And then what's left is boring. So uh, variation of GIT 
results, given equivalence, if the sum of the weights are zero, um, and an embedding one way or the other, if the sum of the weights is not zero. So I bring all this, I bring up this GIT picture because um, I want to I want to, to go for more the intersection of more than one hypersurface. Maybe I should give some more examples. So should I should I take my break at ten till five till on the hour? Uh, it's up to you. Whatever I feel like it's when there's a good spot. Okay. Um, not much beyond the hour. No. Okay. No indeed. <laughs> Um, so, for example, the derived category of a cubic fourfold is this category of examples. Is this category of matrix factorizations, right, the sort of the Orlov one, not the big one. Um, and then three line bundles. And, and this thing, um, maybe I should say that. The, so this thing, this wants to be the derived category of a K3 surface. Um, why? Because it has the same uh, Sarah duality, takes the same form here and here. So x, x i between A and B is x 2 minus i between B and A dual. Uh, and has the same uh, Hochschild homology and cohomology. So that's some, some version of homology and cohomology that's appropriate to this derived category set. Um, I, said, I said that derived categories are a bit like a cohomology theory. Maybe I'll just tell you the Hodge diamond of this cubic is looking like this. And it looks very much like you have the Hodge diamond of a K3 surface, and then and then three more bits. Um, and then there's a whole fun theory of when sometimes this thing actually is the derived category of the K3 surface, and then the cubic always turns out to be rational, and there are conjectures to Kuznetsov that this should be if and only if. So there's a whole there's a lot of fun to be had there. Um, when there is an actual K3 there, can you, is there a, sorry, when, when that happens, when there is an actual K3, is there a correspondence that explains this? Um, yeah, it, it's, so, so this is. a correspondence is, to make you some map which puts the cohomology of the K3 in there in that way, or? Yeah, so it's, it's true that what we were talking about before, this cohomology of K3, appears in this Hodge structure, if and only, well, almost if and only if uh, this appears in there. Um, one direction is, is, is true, and the other direction is true on a dense open set of, set of moduli space, which is probably the whole thing. This is a paper of mine with Richard Thomas. Um, that sort of Hodge theory controls the direct category in this case. Um, if I just took a quadric, Um, uh, quadric 2n fold. This is this category of matrix factorizations, and then a bunch of line bundles. Um, I don't promise that I'm going to be. I think it's all 2n, but I, I don't swear that I've got that number right. This thing is just equivalent to the derived category of two points. Because like I said there were basically only two matrix factorizations. The one I wrote. Well, I wrote that down for a surface, but you can write one down in higher dimensions too. The one I wrote, and it's transpose. And and the the, uh, the cohomology looks like a bunch of ones, and then a two in the middle, and then a bunch of ones. And the numbers the numbers really work out. Um, 
Which means it shows in general that if, if D, if the degree, if the degree divides n plus 1, then this category of the Orlov's graded matrix factorization category um, uh, is, is Kalabi-Yau in that the, the um, Sarah duality takes the same form that it would on a Calabia variety of dimension, n plus 1 divided by d. And so, um, but unfortunately, these are actually the only two examples where you can really get geometry, like geometry in the strictest sense out of this category. Another example, I'll do one more example before I go on to talking about intersections of two things. Um, um, is uh, the derived category of a cubic sevenfold. So living in P8. So you notice that 3 divides 8 plus 1. So you expect to get a Calabio threefold. This decomposes into this category of matrix factorizations. And then, have I got the right numbers here? Do not mess up the numbers. Um, and then O up to O5. And the Hodge diamond is a sevenfold, so I should have 0, 1, 2, 3. Five, six, seven, and then there are some eighty fours here. Ones. And so this this looks very much like you have something that looks like the middle cohomology of a Calabi-Yau threefold sitting there. Um, so if there were an, an honest Calabi-Yau threefold, um, it's Hodge diamond. So I need to delete uh, six of these ones. If, if we believe this analogy between this is like this is like the primitive cohomology, I need to throw away six ones here, and, and that would leave me with this. So I would have some Pallavi L threefold with the card rank zero, which is which is not very geometric, but it's it's it's. Uh, Fun to consider, nonetheless. So what have we seen? I'll, I'll say one more thing before the break. What have we seen? We've seen matrix factorizations um, can have some geometry in them. Uh, when you have a calabi variety, the category of matrix factorizations is the same as the derived category of sheaves. When you have something Fano, something of sort of small degree, relative to the dimension, then you get some interesting piece of the subcategory, sorry, interesting piece of the derived category is given by matrix factorizations, and the rest is a bit boring. And sometimes it contains geometry, like there. So the very best example of that, of that story, where you decompose the category and there's some geometry, is, um, is not a hypersurface, it's an intersection of two quarks. And, and so, so I guess we now we're into section two, which is complete intersections. Equal to three. Um, And this, you could do this in any odd dimensional space. So, so this example is in this form with the bottle and Orlov in 95, but it goes back to Miles Reed's thesis <coughs> in 72, and even back to Vey and Carlitz in the 50s. So I'm going to have x be an intersection of two quadrics. 
B5. So this is a threefold. Um, the Hodge diamond of it looks like this. It's a threefold. And again, you could do this in any odd dimension. If you put 2g plus 1 there, then you get g and g there, and a bunch more ones. So this looks like, well, the derived category of x decomposes into um, a copy of the derived category of a genus 2 curve and two line bundles, which is very plausible. Here. That looks like that looks like a genus 2 curve. I should say something about the geometry of it. Um, let's say that my two quadrics are um, q1 equals q2 equals 0. So what is the genus 2 curve? You take a p1 and for every point, you know, a or a, b in p1, you can ask, uh, is the quadric aq1 plus bq2 equals 0 smooth? Is it a nice smooth quadric? Or does it become singular? And it's going to become singular at a, if you've chosen, if x was smooth, then these singularities are going to occur at exactly six points. So this, these points correspond to smooth quadrics, and these ones correspond to the singular quadrics. And what you're going to do is you're going to take the double cover of P1 branched over those six points. Take the double cover, and it's going to be branched at those six points. The double cover in these gaps here is often the complex part of the um, And that will be a genus 2 curve. It will be a hyperelliptic curve. And, and geometrically, the double cover corresponds to the two, two rulings of the smooth quadric, and the branch points correspond to the one ruling of the singular quadric. It only has one family of lines on it. And so they and Carlitz. Well, Carlitz first, and then Vey very rudely observed that he could do a lot better with the same method. Um, we're working over a finite field, and they said they could count points on x by counting points on the curve, which they knew how to do from, um, from Artin's thesis. And so they got another example, or another case of the Vey conjectures proved. Um, Reed, what he did was showed that the Hodge structure of this curve is connected to the Hodge structure of this threefold, and Bonnell and Orlov proved this thing about direct categories. And I guess yeah, maybe after the break, I'll explain how you can draw that same change of GIT picture that I drew a minute ago. You can set it up for this example, and um, and you can see this this double cover of P1 is sort of a family of those Orlov um, you know, C6 mod Z2 would be the, the thing that appeared for Orlov's matrix factorization of a quadric in P5. So we'll get a bundle of these over this line. from some very natural geometric construction um, that will tell you about the two points. As I said, the matrix factorizations of your quadric here gave you two points if the quadric was smooth. And we'll play that whole game. And then we'll go on to think about more examples of complete intersections of things of the same degree and um, 